Hello everybody and welcome to another Guitar Guitar interview. I'm Ray and today I'm joined by none other than Sophie Lloyd. Sophie, how are you? Hello, I'm really good, thank you. How are you? I am better now and I'm really looking forward to talking to you. I think we're going to have a great chat about imposter syndrome and about your pretty amazing career up until now. Oh, thank so good you. To you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me on here. Oh, you're quite welcome. The pleasure is all mine. So, yeah, when I heard that you were doing uh, your, your solo album, I was expecting more of a kind of instrumental, shreddy, sort of Joe Satriani guitar <laughs> record. And that's not what you made, is it? No, it's not. Like, I sort of, because I kind of did that a little bit more when I released my very first EP back when I was still like a baby. Um, Delusions, that was all kind of guitar based. But um, yeah, for this album, I wanted to do something a little bit different. And like, I love working with vocalists I love like sort of lyrics and telling stories and stuff so I think this was definitely the direction I wanted to go in yeah yeah totally and so yeah for, for those who have uh, yet to hear it the the record is proper hard rock songs and different vocalists uh you've got all kinds of amazing talent on there so I'm wondering uh about the writing process but I'm also wondering about the the vocalists and how you selected who appears on the record yeah, so this album was like inspired by Slash's first self-titled album, where he like, you know, collabed with people from a range of different genres and, you know, Lemmy, Chris Cornell, and then he also did like Fergie and stuff from more pop stuff. So it was inspired by that. So that's sort of the kind of thing I wanted to do. So basically the idea for this album was I wanted to make a record for my 15 year old self who, you know, was a bit lost and wasn't sure where she was going. She just knew she loved music. She loved these bands. And so many of the vocalists that are on the album were people I had as posters on my wall, like growing up and people that just inspired me so much. And I would listen to their music all the time on the way to school and stuff. So that I kind of picked a few people that I knew I wanted and I kind of wrote, wrote songs that um, were kind of tailored towards them and their style a little bit and then kind of just pitched it to them. And to my surprise, a lot of them said yes. <laughs> wow. So you were you were basically kind of like, it's like wish fulfillment. Like the, in, in my wildest dreams, I would have singer A, B, C, like Lizzie Hale or whomever. And then you wrote a song that you thought might appeal to them and then just went, do you want to sing on it? Yeah, literally. <laughs> Pretty much. Just shoot, shoot, shoot in my shot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> slid in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, it worked. You know what I mean? And, and there's such a rich kind of like, 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 kaleidoscope of singing and, and so in that case when you're putting the material together then presumably you'll have written lots of songs but are there more ones that we haven't heard yet that didn't make it to the record uh yeah there's there's basically i'll start by basically writing like a glorified kind of backing tracks and then sending them out to to vocalists and i'll do that a lot anyway like i love writing that's one of the things I love so I've already got like quite a bit of material for like the next album or whatever I want to do with it there was one song that didn't make it onto this album it was more like pop punk and it just didn't really fit with mm. the we didn't know where to place it. it didn't really fit with the vibe so maybe that'll come out at, at some point in the future um but yeah like this was we knew that these were like the songs that fit on the album really really well yeah and so uh when it comes to sequencing like did you have a fairly good idea of like a kind of like overall narrative flow or is it just banger after banger? It was, so I kind of wanted to tell a story, but not like quite so like linear, mm. like the whole kind of album revolves around this idea of imposter syndrome and self doubt and anxiety. So when I'd pitch it to, um, to the vocalists and the musicians, I'd sort of explain like, this is, what the overarching theme is and you know I'd give them some information about that and what it meant to me and everything like that and then they kind of took that and made it their own took their own um you know sort of through through their own vision and mm. um, they kind of wrote the lyrics so that was really cool to and it was interesting because everyone I spoke to always came back with like a similar story of like oh yeah I get this all the time which was really interesting and kind of like healing for me yeah yeah I can imagine I can imagine I know uh... Well, the, the album itself is called Imposter Syndrome. And uh, is that sort of like a, a kind of metaphor about how you've been thrown into the deep end of a kind of, I wouldn't in any way say out of nowhere, but from a certain stage in your career to huge. And does that in, in, induce those feelings of kind of like not belonging? Or is it that kind of idea? 
Yeah, like basically for anyone that doesn't know, imposter syndrome is basically the belief that you don't deserve any of your achievements or your successes. And um, you're just kind of happen to be there by luck and any moment you'll be outed as this like imposter or fake or whatever, you know. And um, that I think that all started because, you know, a lot of my career was sort of unconventional. I grew up online. I was from a small town that didn't have much of a live music scene. So I would turn to the internet, you know, where you can edit your videos loads. You can do as many takes you want. You can do like six or seven takes to get like a good one. So I think I kind of got into this mode where everything I posted online was stuff that I was like 100% happy with and like, you know, pretty much perfect. And that sort of created this unrealistic bar mm -hmm. for me that I was like, I felt like I could never hit and... I think that, you know, sort of gave me a lot of self-doubt and performance anxiety because I knew when I did perform live, like I could never reach this unrealistic bar that's been set where I hit every note absolutely perfectly and, you know, <laughs> everything like that. So I think that's that's what it was. And this album was kind of me working through that and trying to overcome that. Interesting. I, I actually, in all the kind of like newer generation of people coming through on the social media i've never actually considered that notion of you have infinite time to get that one performance perfect but now you're in front of a live audience and you're playing with people like machine gun kelly and so on and yeah you people will hear that that if you play any notes incorrectly that that it's going to be i never even thought of the pressure to, what's that like having to deal with yeah exactly it is that it's just like you say it's just like a lot of it just felt like so much pressure and because up to then like i hadn't I hadn't really played live at all. Like I'd been in like some local bands, but I think I hadn't played any of my own material live, if you know what I mean, which was yeah. kind of where it all stemmed from. So I don't know. I think what, what helped me was um, I sort of went for it gradually where I started talking about it more, telling, you know, sharing my experiences. And then I joined Twitch, which was really, really good for me because it still kind of has that barrier of a screen there but it is technically live and like people can see that you're human and that you mess up. People can see the whole process of you writing a song and it going from sounding like complete garbage to, you know, sounding good and they can kind of see that. So that really, really helped. And then um, I think just through doing that, it kind of built my confidence and changed my mentality where it's like live music isn't about playing perfectly and playing every note exactly like it's great if you do mm. but it's more about the fun and the energy and the performance that you give and like just making the audience feel included and giving them you know a great entertaining night and just having fun with it for sure for sure and uh talking about the, the actual the writing and there's some really great riff moments i mean it, we're, we're talking about hard rock here riffs are key to the experience and uh, fall of man was one that really that I really noticed. So I was wondering, when you're going about your business as a guitar player, as a musician, are you collecting riffs and put, you know, like on your voice memos or onto the laptop? How do you go about coming up with these riffs and remembering them? Yeah, like like that one in particular was, I found what helps with a lot of riffs is kind of giving yourself a few boundaries. So I knew I wanted to write a riff in like an odd time signature of some kind. And I knew I kind of wanted it to be inspired by like, Alice in Chains kind of meets animals as leaders, like a little bit more new metal. So that was kind of the boundaries I put. So my my boyfriend, who is a drummer, kind of wrote this um, uh, six four beat, and so I had that drum pattern there. And then I sort of just started playing around, messing around, and seeing what I could come up with that had that. And then I kind of came up with that riff, and then that like tap line. And um, it just kind of grew from there. And once I've got the kind of intro, I find it quite easy to go on and write the the rest of the song relatively quickly. Mm. So, um, but yeah, I'm always sort of trying to think of, you know, maybe it's in a cool effect or something you found on a pedal. Like you've just got a new pedal that makes this crazy delay. Like I just got the Tim Henson uh, archetype um, from Neural DSP. And like, I've been messing around with like some of his stuff because he's got some crazy uh, cool like, uh, octave patterns and like some really really interesting effects I'd never played with and that's been like inspired a lot of creativity in me so whenever I find something new or cool like I always try and uh do something with that mm. and do you I mean I, I love by the way the uh, uh Alice in Chains meets animals as leaders that is like such a perfect combination isn't it yeah. like, <laughs> the spirit worlds making each other so uh, would you kind of like do you hang on to ideas sometimes and go back through months worth of riffs or if you hear something good do you tend to develop it until it's more like a track 
It kind of depends. Like I've definitely got about like a hundred files being like song one, shit song, song I hate. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like, yes, just I saved with the most stupid, stupid names. Like <laughs> whether it's like a bar of music or something that I'm like, just in case. And often I'll like go through and listen and see if it's, if it's anything I can like uh, build it with. Um, mm. But generally once, if I've got a riff that I actually really, really like, then um, I'll try and continue with it. Like what I find quite helpful is like finding a song, like a riff I like, or like a song I'm into, and then kind of taking a riff that they do, flip it upside down, slow it down, put it in a different key, you know, giving yourself some sort of starting point, I think is is really helpful. Mm. And that's sort of how I, I managed to write, like I managed to write quite, quite a lot and quite quickly. And like, you know, there's always gonna be a lot of shit ideas in there but that's just part of the process. That's part of the learning process. Yeah, that's a, actually a really good point about the whole notion of, you know, like a, how an artist, like a painter is really scared of like the blank canvas or, mm. or a writer about the blank page. You're yeah. Kind of, you're doing that thing where you're you're covering the canvas with something. Like you mentioned there, you get some piece of audio and twist it around and put it backwards and then you have a, you have a context. Exactly, that's the thing. Cause yeah, like knowing where to start is the most difficult part where you're just staring at that blank you know logic project or whatever you're like I don't know what to do so that's that gives you it's good to have some sort of something to give you a little bit of inspiration to give you a boost and then it could end up being something completely different you know sure sure absolutely that's really interesting um, yeah like even stuff like uh like there was one where I took like a trumpet line from like a I can't remember who it was, but like, it was like a, it's like a jazz song. And then I turned it into like this kind of more metal rock thing. And it's like, you can take things from literally anywhere, any sort of genres and make it, make it something new. Oh, most definitely. I mean, you've got people like, you listen to like Hans Zimmer or something and his, his orchestra has a rock band. So you could, you could take that part from Inception and turn it into a guitar riff or something. Exactly. Sudden, yeah. Totally different exactly. context. Which has nothing to do with your album, but you know, we're, we're just chatting. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is guitar, guitar, and quite a lot of our audience are massive gearheads. So let's talk guitars, let's talk pedals. And when I'm talking about this, I wonder, even as to make a distinction to begin with, when we talk about what you use in the studio to record the records, would that be the same as what you use live? Would you use the same sort of equipment? No. So what I, it's always like a little bit different depending on what, what I'm doing. So, um, when I'm at home, just like recording for like YouTube videos and stuff, I'll use, um, like I mentioned, the Neural DSP, the mm. archetypes. I use the Nolly one a lot, a lot from uh, Periphery, and I just got the Rabia one, the Tim Henson one, as I said. So um, I'll explore a lot of that just because that's a super easy and quick way to get some really, really cool sounds and to experiment with them, you know, without having to have a big amps down here and make loads of noise because you know I I was in a London flat before this so I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't really have an amp uh and when I play with uh, Machine Gun Kelly we use Kempers there right and we've sort of programmed in I love um the EVH 5150 amp so we've kind of designed my tones around kind of around that um which has been really really cool and I I love those tones uh and then for like when I play like my sort of smaller live stuff, I have like a few different pedals. I have the, I can't remember what it's called now for the life of me, the, the Neural DSP foot switch that goes with that. Uh, I forget what it's called. Do you mean the quad, the quad Cortex? Quad Cortex, that's it. Yes, that's what I've been using at the moment for like my smaller kind of function gigs and stuff. And that's that's incredible. I've really, really enjoyed that. And then I also upstairs at my house, I have uh, my diesel VH4, which is my baby, um, which I absolutely love. It's just so heavy to bring around anywhere. And it's so like inconvenient. <laughs> and uh, I use a lot of like Blackstar stuff as well. And um, but yeah, like just lugging amps around, especially when a lot of my gigs, I'm like traveling quite far or like flying or something. It's, yeah. it's just, I'm not able to bring it, unfortunately, but I'd love to play them in in a gig setting again because that was oh, always so much fun of course of course the uh the the quad cortex setting of the evh 5150 is spectacular so um for anybody yeah. wanting that tone that's that's how to get it if you don't have a 5150 it's pretty excellent isn't it yeah it's amazing how well they've like matched everything together yeah yeah i'm a big 5150 guy and i can attest to its uh, authenticity yeah. um, <laughs> So you're a, uh, a Kiesel and Dorsey, am I right in saying that? Yeah. I am, yes. Yes, Kiesel guitars. And you have a signature instrument. 
I do, yes, do I have it here? I don't know, no, it might be upstairs. Um, but yeah, I do, it is a Kiesel SL6, it's called, I think I might have, I don't have my name on here. This is one of them, no, that's not one. I have so, sorry, I, I am knocking them around like crazy as well, I promise, <laughs> I'm just clumsy. Uh, yeah, I don't actually have one here, they're upstairs. But, um, yeah, they're kind of, they're like an Aries model shape. And um, I love Kiesel in particular because you have the ability to kind of customize the instrument and make it exactly kind of how you want it, which I think is really, really cool. Cause like, you know, a guitar is ex an extension of yourself. You know, you want to be able to express yourself through a guitar. So I didn't just want to limit to one design so people can like, you know, change the colors. We have a couple top woods as well. Uh, that's a really cool option. Um, the basics of it is it's a black limber body and a walnut neck, which I love black limber because it's similar tonal characteristics to mahogany. So it's got that kind of warm round tone. Like I love, um, you know, Gibson Les Pauls and stuff. So yeah. I love that, that kind of really rock and roll raw tone. So it, it kind of emulates that a little bit while being a lot more lightweight. So you can throw it around and run around stage and, and all of that without getting too much fatigue on your shoulder. Sure. And um, what, I specifically like what make, makes kind of my guitar unique among the Kiesel line is it's got a um, Sustainiac. It's the only guitar with a Sustainiac pickup in it. So um, on the bridge, it's the Kiesel Lithium uh, Passive Pickup, which I love. Sounds great. Really, really versatile. Super good for, for rocking out and like jazz stuff as well. It does a bunch of different stuff. And then in the neck position, it's a Sustainiac, which is basically, it basically kind of lets the note ring out forever. Mm -hmm. So um, like use, use it a lot on their Manson guitars, which I think is really cool. I've seen, you know, Buckethead use it as well. And um, it just kind of makes the note ring on you. And you have like three different harmonic settings so you can get a cool harmonic or you can just have the note itself. I think it goes up to like two octaves above. And it's just really cool. Like with the whammy bar, I've got a trem trem arm on, on this and you can make it just do some crazy sounds, which I absolutely love. And it's got a kill switch on it as well that lights up pink. Um, and it just, it's kind of like a Gibson sound if it was a shred guitar with 24 frets and made some silly noises. Wow. Um, <laughs> really epic. See that combination of the uh, whammy bar and then the sustainer that lets you go. I mean, is it like a Floyd Rose style sustainer? You've, uh... It's not Floyd. I find Floyd, Floyd Rose is the most annoying things on the planet. Okay. So it's uh, just a, it's just like a trem arm. It's the Kiesel hip shot trem. Um, but like, I don't know how Keats will do their tuners, but they're so good. It just doesn't really go out of like, you can literally hold it like this. You can wave it around and it just doesn't, doesn't nice. go out of tune. Nice. Do you, get, do, you, do you get quite a lot of, you know, like if you went to dive bomb, does it go quite low? Yeah, it goes, it goes all the way down, which nice. is great. Yeah, that it's was, really that, good. It's the whole thing about that whole, you know, like if you have the sustainer with the, the octave settings on it, you can go to like, like, like subterranean with a whammy bar. and then It's so it cool, yeah. <laughs> So high up 24 frets and then the harmonics you've got like pitches that guitars just can't do otherwise literally yeah it's it makes the most crazy like little alien sounds ever <laughs> like i was i was always really inspired by surfing with the alien by joe satriani and that always had some cool like alieny sounds so i wanted oh, to yeah. get <laughs> oh, yeah 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 ace nine is responsible for all kinds of nonsense isn't it oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh well keeping on that subject then like um do you prefer lighter or heavier strings uh, I prefer, I always use 10s to 46s, the paradigms, paradigm, I don't know how you say it. I've heard no people paradigm, say. you're right. <laughs> no paradigm, okay, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've used them um, forever pretty much. Occasionally, if I'm doing like for a lot of my uh, Metal Monday stuff, I only have six string guitars, so I'll put on some heavier gauges so I can tune down. Mm. But yeah, I prefer for it to be a little bit lighter. I do a lot of bending and stuff, so I just find that's easier to me i've only got weak little fingers you know oh. <laughs> only small <laughs> well you know it's all about what you do with those fingers right and you you're, you're pretty spectacular <laughs> exactly. player, so yeah. Yeah, you're all good you're all good uh what about plectrums then what's your favorite uh i use i have like some custom picks that these uh dunlop ones ah yes which are uh what are they um are they nylon no they're Oh, I can't remember now. They're not nylon. The well, they're like zero point eight, and I've just been trying. Sorry, I'm on like oh the different different way things. I've just been trying trying these ones actually, which I love, which are Dunlop, the flow gloss ones. So I think yeah. I'm gonna 
I'm going to move towards these. These ones are a bit thicker. These ones are two millimeters, which I'll use if I'm doing my metal Monday stuff. But like generally I'll use like around one millimeter or 1.14. Mm -hmm. I find it's like the best for me. But yeah, these flow gloss ones are really, really cool because they've got mm. this grip here and it's kind of like indented in, which I found really handy. And um, yeah, these ones I think are one, I think these ones are 1.14. Oh, I, I wish I could remember the material that it's one of those materials you don't, it's not like an obvious one. Yeah, it could be like Duralin or something like that, right? That, I think that's it. I think ah, that's it. Yeah. For, for the purposes of today, we're going to go with Turilin. That's that's. Yes, what exactly. <laughs> Potentially, but who really knows? <laughs> who really knows? Exactly, exactly. Okay, so a gauge ten and a relatively heavy pick. That sounds like a good yeah, thing definitely. Yeah. It's been I've been trying out a bunch of different ones recently, though, um, just to try and because I'm going to make a new pick line. I think so. I'm been trying out a bunch of different materials and stuff, and that's kind of what I've landed on that I like the best. Excellent, excellent. That sounds really exciting. Right. Things like that, the minutia of it, the people think some some guitar players think a pick is a pick, but it too too light and you don't get it coming back, too heavy yeah. and you don't get the rhythm. You gotta get these things right, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Especially when you're doing like quite fast picking or like sweeping stuff. Like if it's if it's too thin, you're like wasting valuable time. Yes. <laughs> yes. Microseconds count. Exactly. <laughs> Are you much of a fan? Of, just since you mentioned sweep, pe sweep picking, is that something that you're quite fond of doing? Uh, yeah, like I'm not very good at doing the, those massive sweeps that go on forever that's just up and down for like hours. Yeah, um, yeah I love like throwing them in. I'm trying to get more into uh, economy picking as well at the moment, which is kind of combining, you know, alternate picking with, with sweep picking. Because I think it's just like, I love I love the sound of it. I love how it sounds smooth. It's, you know, you've sort of, I love the C-shape in a sweep that's the one that my hand always lands on really really well and i love just throwing it in there i know what you mean i know what you mean and um since i have used my captive audience right now and i i could do with a bit of help with my sweep picking can you give me any tips on how to sort of just get that a bit smoother uh i'd say muting is is key mm -hmm. so like uh you know once you've once you've fretted the notes with this hand, lift off your finger, like kind of straight away, like use both hands to mute. Don't just rely on your palm. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like moving with, like your palm is moving down with it and your uh, fingers are moving off and kind of helping mute the strings below. They're sort of lying flat enough that they're muting the strings below and mm -hmm. you're taking them off. So you're muting the strings above as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to explain without a guitar, I guess. But um, that and also just find shapes you're comfortable with and kind of like rinse them. Like I said, like I love that C shape. Um, I'm also, you know, just sort of speaking in terms of like the cage system here, like the um, I love the C shape. Also, the D shape lends quite well to me as well. A lot of people will like the A shape. That's quite an easy one. So I think finding something that just sits well under your fingers mm. and just rinsing it like you don't need to be able to necessarily sweep every single shape in every single position just pick ones you like and then um you know use them basically yeah. just find find experiment and find which one your fingers can do comfortably yeah 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 that's some good advice that's some good advice i i don't know why i didn't think about it as in terms of just using the open as you say the cage sort of open chords but you just shift them up and then you just play yeah. them that's a really obvious thing but one that i haven't thought of before so thanks for that yeah. um now, other things, because you're a, a, a highly successful professional and I want to learn from you, okay? Um, got some, <laughs> we've got, got some tips here for the people that are going to be watching this one. And I suppose one of the most fundamental things, you spoke earlier about how you built your, uh, your career online, you know, via the computer rather than gigging and so on. Let's, could, you, could you suggest ways in which people who want maybe to sort of like follow in your footsteps in that regard, how they might want to build an online audience? Sure. I'd say the main thing is, is just like, do it. Just post that first video because people will always be like, oh, I really want to do this. But then they just, they won't post because they don't have the right camera. They, it didn't sound good. They don't have the right microphone. So they'll delay posting. And that's, you know, valuable time. You could have been, could have been like sharing your videos. And at the moment actually is the most, perfect time to do it on TikTok because what's really kind of hitting the algorithm now and going viral is really authentic real videos of literally just like you in your bed in your pajamas you know just 
filming it with the room noise, like no production at all, and doing like a cover and hitting like some of the big viral songs that are out on TikTok at the moment. Like that's what's really, really going so big. So it, <clears throat> it doesn't need to be like a big production thing where everything's perfect, like just just start posting. Like my first videos on YouTube were literally were recorded on a potato and sounded <laughs> worst. <laughs> so like, but the point is, is to just get it out there and try and be as consistent as you can with it. And, you know, at the moment, um, short, you know, sh the short vertical content is what's really kind of hitting post on TikTok and post on Instagram as well. And YouTube shorts really rinse the hell out of all of the platforms that you can and it doesn't need to be long videos like i love long form content just because i grew up watching that and doing it on youtube but nowadays that doesn't do as well as just the quick snappy 20 seconds short covers that you could what you can whack out like 10 in one day you know and then you have you know however many days uh posting schedule already sorted so you don't have to think about it so i would say just do it it doesn't need to be perfect doesn't need to be amazing like people are really valuing just realism and authenticity and in, in playing so track your you know do it to track your learning process as well i think that's really interesting so really? yeah just do it <laughs> just do it just do it like the nike advert Fantastic. exactly <laughs> and one of the other ones that i think is is, is equally useful but that, because a lot of people would be uh maybe apprehensive for the sake of the fact that online trolling is ridiculous and it's terrible and you know i've, I've experienced it myself and i know you have too what are your tactics for whether internal or back at them how do you deal with trolls there's a few different ways like i've gotten to a place now where i it doesn't really bother me at all and i kind of managed to just avoid looking at it um i think you've just got to surround yourself with good people that will always big you up and know know that you're good but if you do get get trolls it's a sign of success, you know, like uh, that's that means your video is reaching a vast audience of people. And, you know, trolls are only they're just they're doing it because they're insecure of themselves. You know, what I mean, that they're not doing it, that you're they're annoyed your video's got this many views when there's they haven't even posted a video because, uh, you know, it's funny Gary sitting in his mum's basement still, you know. <laughs> so I like that's what it is. You just got to have that mindset of like you're the one out there posting and you know sort of doing it and they're just in their room behind a screen and there's definitely like I went through a really a really bad one where it was like my Nirvana smells like teen spirit shred version that was like quite a few years ago like 2018 or something now 2019 but that was the first very first time I had this kind of onslaught of hate and um you know really kind of pretty brutal stuff as well literally like it was like people would tell me to like kill myself i'm like my dude it's a guitar cover like <laughs> like it's fine <laughs> just don't watch it so <laughs> it's like it's really not that big a deal so i think you've just you know if you see a hate comment just delete it block it don't respond that's what they want they want you to respond like i sort of i don't really read anything or look at anything about me because i know there's always going to be hate comments like i'm lucky that on my platforms it's all pretty nice i notice when other people share this share like my stuff to other platforms that's when mm. you know it gets bad because you know i have boobs and and all that but you know <laughs> for sure for sure boobs are great so why not <laughs> absolutely absolutely i mean that's a that's something that, 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 that i i don't know much about but the, the kind of like the trouble with being the, the the patriarchy and being a girl who wants to play rock, and I'm sure that's not been something that's been easy to contend with. But I mean, how 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 real is that kind of problem out there? I'd say it's definitely getting better. Like I think um, I'm seeing so many more, especially with the rise of social media, so many more amazing, amazing female musicians really putting themselves out there across all range age ranges, and I think that's awesome and there's a lot of more live female musicians in bands like Beyonce's all female Olivia Rodrigo you know Demi Lovato they're all like female and so I think it's definitely definitely shifting there's still like a kind of thing where it's you know people always want to comment on the fact of what you're wearing or you know all of this stuff which again it's just it's what it's just what happens and you just sort of have to have a relatively thick skin and like I'm aware what I want to wear and um 
you don't you don't have to watch and i always say you know there's always that comment that's like oh i watched this on mute and i'm like hey a mute watch if you watch it on mute it's the same to me as a normal watch it's the same amount <laughs> so you watch it on mute you keep it on repeat and you can pay <laughs> pay my rent you know <laughs> yeah yeah for real yeah yeah so it's yeah. like you know just it, it happens you've just got to have a thick skin laugh about it and in your real life like the real life make sure you know the difference between real and online and surround yourself with good people in your real life that know who you are, know your true self and build you up. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant advice. Absolutely brilliant advice. So we'll round it off by saying uh, imposter syndrome. Now, when is that released? It is released on the 10th of November. Uh, yes, it is uh, now available for pre-order for like the physical copies and stuff at shop.sophieguitar.com. You can pre-order limited edition vinyls, posters, t-shirts. All of that stuff. Shameless plug. <laughs> no, 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 that's the entire purpose for, for doing it. It's all good. And uh, I, I didn't actually remember. Are you planning to do some touring to support the release? I would love to. It's it's not going to be this year. It'll probably end up being next year. We haven't announced anything yet. We're still trying okay. to figure out what the live show will look like because it's so many guests and, and all of that. Um, but yes, we will be touring uh, next year for sure. Excellent. Fantastic. I will be sure to be there and swell everybody else in Guitar Guitar. Yes, so you be, better. Yeah, <laughs> that's me too. It's been so much fun talking to you. Thank you so much for giving up your time and for giving me such a brilliant conversation. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers.